Hello and welcome to Geography A-Level Taster Session. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mr Byrne and I'm the Head of Geography at Newstead Wood. Um, and I will be running this session today. Um, sorry you can't put a face to the name, but hopefully all being well in September, uh, you will get to meet me. So um, in the purpose of today's session is to really just give you a little bit of a heads up on Geography A-Level at Newstead Wood, uh, and also to do a short activity. Uh, this activity relates directly to something that we will be doing later in the course, uh, but it will give you a sense of what's to come, and hopefully you'll find it interesting as well. So uh, in order to prepare for the session a bit later on, you will need some resources. I've indicated two of them here. There are two short articles, uh, Island of No Return and Cyclone Pam, Earthquakes and Tsunamis. If you click on the links, it should take you to Word documents, which you can then print out. Uh, and I will, um, I will refer to those a bit later on. So let's get started. So A-level geography at Newstead Wood uh, covers the Edexcel A-level course, a very popular uh, course, very well designed course that's liked by huge amounts of schools around the country. And you will be taught the A-level geography course over a two year period. We no longer offer the AS course. Uh, we find that squeezing an AS course into one year and doing it well uh, doesn't actually result in as good a result as you do if you do A-level. So we found that students who do a two-year A-level result get a much better uh, outcome than they do if they do an AS. You've got two years to hone your skills, improve your writing, read more geography, watch more programs, learn more, and as a result of which, hopefully, at the end of the two-year course, you'll be getting some of those very top grades that our geographers get every year, A's and A-stars, many of whom go off to read geography at university, around a third often do, including Oxford and Cambridge. So um, you will meet in September, if you haven't already come across uh, a few different staff, myself, that's Mr. Byrne, I'm head of geography. Uh, there's also uh, Miss Garswood, who will be teaching you as well as me in year 12. And there's Miss Raw, who you'll meet in year 13. She teaches some units in year 13. We have some uh, dedicated geography rooms, both in the sixth form block and in the main part of the school. Um, and that's where you will have your geography lessons. So first things first, uh, hopefully you have come across the uh, website that I set up for the transition into A-level geography. If not, don't worry, um, there's an opportunity to do so now or to do so a little bit later, maybe after this session. Um, so what you're interested in is heading over to the website which outlines uh, a couple of different things. Uh, reading lists, uh, good things to read, things we encourage you to read, not only reading but also things to watch, TED Talks and that kind of thing. Um, but it contains what we call bridging units. So bridging units are um, pieces of work that help span the gap between GCSE and A-level and start to bring your thinking and your standards up to be of an A-level standard. So um, if you haven't been there already, you'll need to go to the A-level transition website. Um, it's got a very long, silly web address, um, but I've done a short one, which you can see here, short URL dot at forward slash PU, small letters or large letters H I Y, or alternatively just click on the link and it should take you to the site. You'll see that there are two bridging units. There is one for uh, regeneration, which is what I, the first unit I will be teaching in year 12, um, which is a, obviously quite a human unit. And there is another one for a physical unit, geomorphic processes on the Dorset coast. And that's what Miss Garswood will be teaching uh, at the beginning of year 12. So I will be teaching you one human unit in two lessons a week and Miss Garswood will teach you a physical unit in two lessons a week. And then when we get to the end of those units, uh, I will teach you a physical unit in two lessons a week and Miss Garswood will teach you a human unit in two lessons a week and so on throughout year 12. And as we move into year 13, that pattern will continue. But as I said earlier, we also have Miss um, Raw, who will teach you a unit as well. And you'll get four lessons in year 12 and five lessons in year 13. 
Anyway, enough about that for now. Um, on this site, there are these two bridging units. Bridging units are really valuable pieces of work. They are not there to waste your time. They do several different things. The first thing is that they uh, establish, help you to establish some A-level skills. So A-level students, in addition to turning up to lessons and doing homework, you'd expect in any A-level subject to be doing quite a bit of reading around the subject, integrating resources, developing your knowledge. This is really a bridge to working at university where there's an awful lot more independent time in terms of reading articles and so on than there is actually in lectures. So these two units are here to build up your skills, um, but they're also there to introduce and support content that's coming in the A-level course. So how has London Docklands changed, which is the human bridging unit? We're actually going to use the London Docklands site, Canary Wharf, Millwall Dock, East India Quay, that area, and an area just outside Docklands called Custom House as two locations that we will be studying in detail in terms of regeneration. And that's because the course requires us to look at a study location and a contrasting location. So we'll be using those locations. So the work you do on this is actually forming the basis of a pretty substantial case study that you could use or would need to use possibly in your exam. So uh, please, please do invest the time and effort in this particular piece of work, because as I say, if you don't, if you don't have that background, you'll be starting from a much further back situation than students who have done this work before starting. You may have even studied London Docklands before at GCSE or come across it, probably even visited it maybe. Um, but we will be looking at it in different ways. So the bridging unit is laid out to, as I say, encourage some skills, things like timelines and referencing, but also to develop the key questions. And the key questions are actually strands from our A-level course. So uh, you've got how has London Docklands uh, changed? Um, and there's a bridging unit to produce for that. And then you've got a shorter bridging unit looking at the Dorset coast, really starting to bring together GCSE skills in terms of processes and landforms that you've done, no doubt, coasts at GCSE and bring them into the context of a place. Uh, and that's really to form the bedrock of your uh, coastal study, where obviously uh, detail uh, will be developed at a more A-level, um, advanced level style. And so uh, that will provide a basis for that. So those bridging units are available on that website. Do please look at that look at that and sort, uh, sort them out before coming in September. When you come in September, you'll present those um, bridging units, uh, the Docklands one to me and the geomorphic processes of the Dorset coast to Miss Garswood. We will then uh, look at those and give them back to you with some feedback. And we are using a relatively straightforward system, um, which you may well have come across before, red, amber and green. Yeah, Green represents um, work that is most definitely an A grade standard or thereabouts. So high grade B right the way through to A star. So green is what we're aiming for. OK, uh, and amber would be a solid piece of work, but there are areas of improvement. And really at an amber, we're looking at a grade C, maybe into a low grade B. What you obviously don't want is a red. A red would indicate that the work is sub A level standard. So we're looking at D, E and below. OK, so the color just gives you a vague indication of the sort of general standard of the work. What's more important is the feedback that you'll get from myself and Miss Garswood in terms of what you've done well and what could have been improved. This really is just to start to get some work under your belt, get some understanding of the, of the nature of the work and the quality of the work required at A-level so that you can get uh, to work at an A-level standard as quickly as possible. And we can pick up on any areas that we want you to focus right at the start of the course so that we don't waste precious time in the course before we discover that you're perhaps not researching something in the depth required or misunderstanding something. They also act as fantastic bridges. If you haven't done much on one, one or either of these at GCSE, they're very good at bringing you up to pace. So do please check out the website. All the details are available on there. If you do have any problems, questions or queries, if you either email me direct or if you don't have my email, email school. And once the school has got the email, it'll be passed on to me and I'll uh, let you know um, an answer to your questions.
Okay, so um, I always think it's important to do some actual geography in these sessions. You don't want them to just be information sessions. So I thought it would be a good a good idea to have a, a snapshot of something that is at a sort of A level standard. Um, you've probably done something about tectonic hazards at GCSE. Um, and tectonic hazards is one of the physical units, one that I teach within the course. And so I thought I'd pick up on um, one aspect within that and have a look at just one tiny bit of it as we've only got to the 20 minutes or so. So we're going to have a look at a place called Vanuatu. And uh, Vanuatu is uh, a place which you may never have heard of. But as you'll see, as time goes on, there's a reason why I'm looking at it. And we're really looking at the concept of a multiple hazard zone. And the uh, A-level course has a look at one point at multiple hazard zones. And we would, in fact, develop this further into the relationship between those multiple hazards. But for today's session, we'd just like to have a look at the concept of multiple hazards and how they relate. So uh, we'll unpack a little bit about A-level, about examining hazards by studying this place called Vanuatu. OK. Um, We'll move on. As I said before, um, in order to do some of the, the work in here, you'll need to print out those two starting documents. If you haven't done so, I do so before you go much further. OK, so Vanuatu. Vanuatu is an island group. And in fact, it depends very much on what you've read because uh, a number of different sources give slightly conflicting information. Um, so uh, here you can see I said it is a country of 65 islands. In fact, if you count some of the uninhabited atolls in the area, I think some uh, websites suggest it's as many as 85 islands. They cover quite a large area of the Pacific Ocean, spanning over 12,000 square kilometres. Um, and they're quite remote. Um, you can see them on this map. They are the ones outlined in red. And you can see that they're off the northeast coast of Australia. And they're about 1,800 kilometres away. So they are uh, quite a remote location, a place which, as I say, you may never have studied before. And that's one of the things about A-Level is that we don't just revisit GCSE. We look at things in both more depth, but also new and interesting locations where perhaps we'll learn things differently from things you've learned at GCSE. So Vanuatu is quite a remote Pacific island. It's part of the continent of Oceania. Um, it has a population of around 270,000 people. And on average, the islands are approximately half a metre above sea level. They do vary. Obviously, the higher parts are much higher. Um, but if you average it out across the islands, it's about half a metre above sea level. So they're quite a remote uh, location, which is perhaps why you haven't heard of them before. So why are we looking at Vanuatu from a tectonics point of view? Well, Vanuatu is a very interesting location. So what you've got here uh, it might initially seem quite confusing, but you've got a couple of diagrams to try and explain what, uh, how Vanuatu sits in relation to plate tectonics. So uh, if you look at the bottom diagram, a sort of map from above, you can see the outline of Australia, you can see Vanuatu labelled and some other surrounding islands like, for example, New Caledonia. So these islands in this chain of islands uh, that falls uh, around the northeastern and comes uh, northeastern part of Australia and then actually they come round and form across the southeastern part of Australia, they are part of something called an island arc. And an island arc is a chain of islands that form on a oceanic plate uh, caused by volcanoes that start the seabed. And as they erupt and build up layers, they eventually poke up above the sea and make islands. And the reason that that line of volcanoes is there because they are on a uh, plate boundary. They're on a destructive plate boundary where one plate is subducting or diving underneath another plate. And in this situation, what you have is you have the Australian plate, the Indo-Australian plate, that's the uh, Australian India on the same plate. That's actually the edge of that plate is actually going underneath, subducting underneath 
we call it the Pacific plate. The reality is, if you look, you'll see that there are actually a collection of small additional plates like the Fiji plate going on as well. So it's quite a complex sort of micro plate system in this area. But you've got the Australian plate diving down, subducting underneath the Pacific plate. And as that subducting plate dives down, it's being broken up, it's being destroyed in the mantle, producing magma, which is rising up, making volcanoes, which poke up and produce islands, including Vanuatu. So Vanuatu is part of an island arc caused by the Australian plate subducting underneath the Pacific plate. This obviously gives us volcanoes and earthquakes and other tectonic hazards. Now we are studying geography and not geology, so not just trying to study the mechanics of how the volcanoes and the rocks work. Uh, in studying hazards in geography, we're really interested in the interaction between the physical and humans. So we need to know something about Vanuatu. So I've given you a few key facts here which might give you a bit of an impression about what Vanuatu is like. Uh, we've already said it's a, a small island population across about 65 islands. You can see that they have a GDP, a gross domestic product per head of approximately $3,000 per year, which is obviously not very good. Yeah, so it puts them 129th down the list of countries. So quite near the bottom, not the poorest in the, in the world, but certainly quite near the bottom in terms of poverty, um, in terms of monetary poverty. Another way of judging development is HDI, Human Development Index, which utilizes money education and healthcare and it the closer you are to one the better your hdi value is so the hdi is a composite indicator to try and show a much fairer approach to development and you can see it ranks uh, vanuatu ranks 131 in uh, this so even worse than it does just on money alone um, and that as you can see by unpacking some of the information underneath you can start to see why from an educational point of view by the time young people have grown up to become adults um, only just over about 50 percent of them can read their own language which by the way is french they're a french colony uh, their life expectancy is only about 72 which you might compare, which is not too bad, but when you start comparing that to places like the UK where life expectancy in the 80s, um, they obviously have a shorter life. And access to things like medical care is not fantastic. There's an average of 0 0.1 doctors per thousand people. Yeah, so basically one doctor for every uh, 10,000 people. So they're not really very well developed. Back to the tectonics for a minute. And so uh, I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about some of the more dramatic and interesting tectonics on Vanuatu. Uh, Vanuatu has uh, some interesting volcanoes. It has several volcanoes. Here, here are uh, three of them. Um, it has Yasur. Yasur is one of the most active volcanoes in the world, and it it produces what's called the Strombolian activity. So it sort of ejects like hot rocks and pebbles and does little what we call fire fountaining and it does it quite regularly small but quite regularly and you can see a picture there next to it that's the sort of activity that you can expect quite commonly and in fact you can go to Vanuatu to go on volcano tours with a high likelihood of seeing this sort of activity so, frighteningly you can get quite close to that crater to observe that um, because they usually these regular activity is usually quite small but it can get bigger so those activities can be worse so you have the regular activity. We also have um, Ambrim at the bottom. Ambrim is one of the few volcanoes in the world that has a permanent lava lake inside its crater. Yeah, so in fact there are not many places in the world where you have a lava lake inside a crater and this is one of the places that does that. So again you can actually go and look at the lava lake, the volume of it goes up and down. Um, again um, I think people are perhaps a little mad, but there you go. Um, so it has lava, it has lava lakes and it produces a huge amount of gas, particularly a gas called fluorine. And there's Gua, uh, which is a high shield volcano, which has been active since uh, 2011. But there are other volcanoes. So there are very much active volcanoes in this zone. Um, and that's quite important when we go on to think about some of the hazards associated with this location. I would uh, recommend if you're interested, and uh, it's always much more interesting in many respects, if you look up these volcano names on YouTube, there's loads of clips. So you can see people's tourist videos of Yasargao and Ambrim. Um, so there's lots of lots of places where you could actually go and look at this in a video format if you so desire. Um, it's certainly a very interesting place. Okay, on to some geography. So the idea in this session is to 
try and analyze the risk associated with uh, this location, this multiple hazard location. OK, so in a level geography, one of the things that we do is we try and use university level thinking. And so on this slide, you can see there is a thing called the risk equation where risk equals the hazard times the vulnerability divided by the capacity to cope. In other words, to understand risk, we need to understand the hazard itself. We need to understand what makes people vulnerable to the hazard and we need to understand how well they can cope. Yeah, we don't. It's a pseudo equation. We don't actually have to do any maths. It just gives us the aspects to consider. So obviously a weak hazard or a strong vulnerability would give us a lower risk or equally a capacity to cope might offset high risk or uh, sorry, offset high hazards uh, impact or high vulnerability. So what I've done here is I've given you a table for you to break down, extract some key information from both the PowerPoint and the two articles that I have sent you. So the two articles, as I say, you should have printed off. If you'd like to, uh, you can print off a blank version of this or at least a partially completed version of this on the last slide of the PowerPoint and then fill it in. Or alternatively, what you could do is just use a piece of paper to write in the things that are missing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to look carefully at the uh, information. There's not a lot of info, not a lot of text and think about some of the stuff you've already been told about um, Vana Atu and use that information to complete the rows of the table. And you can see that um, I have uh, completed some of those for you. So um, I've volcanic ash. I've just put volcanic ash and then I've left the vulnerability and the capacity to cope free. Um, and then on cyclones, I've given you the word what the hazard is, which is cyclone. I've told you something about vulnerability and left the capacity to cope free. And you can see on the rest of them, I've left various combinations empty. So the idea is to pull out and fill in this table. So the hazard will just be a reference to the hazard. The vulnerability is in what way um, people are vulnerable to it. So if you look at some of the examples I've given here, cyclones, uh, that people are vulnerable because the islands are low lying. They're easily flooded by the tidal surge of a cyclone. And also because they have a low GDP, it means they don't invest much in building construction, which makes them more vulnerable. Yeah. Um, then we have uh, capacity to cope. And that's, as I say, how well people can cope with the situation. Um, so, uh, for example, one at the bottom, which I won't say what it is, uh, medical and dental support is poor. The area we said has only 0.1 doctors per thousand people and alternative water sources are not possible on the island. You would need to import water at a high cost. That will obviously relate to a hazard and people's vulnerability to it. So use the articles to try and complete that table. Um, and I, I would suggest that what you do is pause at this point, look at the articles, use them to fill the table in, and if need be, look back over the presentation. And then when you're ready, move on to the final slide. Welcome back. I hope that didn't take you too long. It's designed to be quite a simple exercise. You shouldn't really have spent more than about 10 minutes on it. Um, so if you looked at that uh, article, article, sorry, at the table, uh, you should hopefully have uh, the, all those gaps filled in and you should be able to think about why Vanuatu is a place of multiple hazards. So what are the hazards and why is this place have those hazards? And you should also be able to think about why does Vanuatu have a poor capacity to cope? What are the things that give it a poor capacity to cope? Yeah, so the, the really the key thing to come out of this is to understand why is Vanuatu a multiple hazard location? What makes it a multiple hazard location and why does it not cope very well? So what I'd like to say is that then in terms of uh, finding the answers to this, there is a separate answer PowerPoint, which you can go to and look at. Uh, you'll see the link and from there you can then uh, check your answers and I'll just talk you through those. Uh, thank you very much and I'll see you with the answers.